<laughs> uh, on this trip, I'm hoping to discover some new species of jumping spiders because that's the, the group I'm most interested in. Yep. And uh, we've actually already found a couple of new species, which is fantastic. So this is Marasis robinsoni. It's a species of uh, peacock oh, spider. So this species was previously only known from uh, the northern coast of New South Wales, and it's really, really interesting that we found it so far inland and in Victoria. So it's quite a significant range extension. Cool. This species here is Maratus faltus. Yeah. Um, so this one again was uh, quite a big range extension. This one was only known from the southwest coast of Western Australia. Um, so the, these these parts here, the the feelers. Um, are a structure called the pedipalps, and in male spiders they're, they're quite enlarged and um, swollen, so that's where the, the spider's mating organs are. Hmm. Okay, so what kind of species? Well, I work on native Australian bees, so I'm out here looking for bees. And it's a really interesting part of the country up in the desert. It's quite different to where I live, down on the coast. So I'm looking for bees that need are very adapted to the dry conditions. And that's what I'm going to find of stuff that's really, really interesting, I think. Yesterday, I found a bee that I did not expect to find up here. And it really, really surprised me. So they're the kind of surprises that you get when you come out and work in an area. I think spiders are just amazing animals. Uh, I started researching them because I was initially quite scared of them. But um, I grew to realise how amazing and diverse that they are. And I'm most interested in the peacock spiders, which have amazing courtship behaviour and uh, lovely colour patterns. It's interesting, I did agricultural science at university, and one of the things that I learnt about was pollination. Crops need pollination. And so I thought that's an interesting subject because I liked insects as well. So I combined my agriculture with pollination and bees, and that's how I began studying bees. Ah. Why do some bees have stripes? That's a really, really good question. The main predator of a bee is a bird. And so if the bees can have stripes and look like they're wasps, then the, then the birds will think, hang on, if I, if I try and bite this wasp, I'll get stung. So the bees, they have what we call mimicry. They're mimicking a wasp, trying to think, I'm gonna be able to sting you, and therefore birds will leave them alone. There, this is a really good question. Are there any carnivorous bees? Now that's a, a straight you think, hang on, bees aren't carnivorous, but there are just six species in Brazil and they feed on roadkill. They go along and they bite the flesh of roadkill. So out of the 20,000 species of bees in the world, six of them are actually carnivorous, <laughs> which is a very strange thing to have a bee thinking of as, as, a, as a carnival. Not on this trip, I only started yesterday, and really I need to take my material back to put under a microscope and examine it, but I have discovered almost 300 new species of bees in my travels and my work around Australia for the last 40 years. So the new species are out there. Believe it or not, we only have described about 30% of the known insect fauna. So there's about 225,000 species we estimate in Australia of insects, and we've only named 30% of them, so there's a lot of work to do. Wow. That's a really interesting question. It all depends. Some flowers present their nectar in a very broad, shallow cup, and other flowers have got it like a big, deep tubular. So if it's a big, deep tubular, what they call a corolla, a bee has to have a long tongue to get down to where the floral, where the, where the sugars are, where the, where the nectar is. As compared to if it's a shallow cup, it can just sit on the side and lap. So the length of the bee tongue determines the kind of flower that it's able to get nectar from. Spider venom isn't really designed to, to take down something as massive as a human. They prey upon insects and small invertebrates, um, mostly. So when they bite us, it's really only out of defense if we accidentally pin them in our clothes or if we're agitating them. Okay. That's interesting. They have to be able to hold water 
either in the root system or in the leaves some way. Uh, and they are excellent at being able to survive in desert conditions because they're gonna have to go quite some periods without any rain or water. So they need to keep material water in reserve is what mm. they've got to be able to do. That's interesting. The female, most female insects have what we call as an ovipositor. That's where the egg goes down and they lay an egg. So we believe that the ovipositor in wasps and bees converted from a fleshy, kind of palpy uh, egg laying tube to a sting. But it doubles up as both a sting and as an ovipositor. So it was the ovipositor the egg laying tube in females that lead to the sting. Well, there are two types of bees, what they call social. There are social bees and there are solitary bees. So if you're thinking about a European honeybee, there's about 50 to 60,000 bees in that. Most of them are all sterile females. They're the workers and one is the queen and she lays lots and lots of eggs. But the other way, is in, the, is in the solitary bees, and all of them are queens in that they all lay their own egg, and being solitary, each of the bees is by themselves. So you go from about 60,000 bees in a hive to just a single bee in a little hive, in a little colony there. So there's a great lot of difference between social and solitary bees, and each of them is very, very successful. Now remember I told you there were, solid, uh, there were social bees and there are solitary bees. The one that you most likely know as the social bee uh, is the European honeybee. That came into Australia in about 1822 and that was used to pollinate crops and that. But believe it or not, out of the 2,000 native species, there are 11 of the native Australian bees that go up the east coast and they're all social. They're called sugar bag bees and you have them up in your area in the Northern Territory. They nest inside a hollow log and if you know what the European honeybee has got a hexagonal cell, well these, uh, these bees don't keep their pollen and nectar in a hexagonal cell but in a pot. It's called a pollen pot and a honey pot. And if ever you get the chance to taste the honey of it, it's quite, quite different. You have to break open a log Maybe some of your elders may know where these sugar bag bees are because the sugar bag is what they call, you get a piece of wax with honey and you chew it a little bit like chewing gum. And you chew it and you get this beautiful mix of honey there. But where you are is where you'll get these sugar bag bees. They don't occur down here. Think of about, about Brisbane and then right up the East Coast, across the Northern Territory and down to about Broome in Western Australia. That's where these 11 species go, and they're native, native, there's what they call youth social, or these social bees. So you've got a very special part of Australia where these beautiful sugar bag bees occur, and if you can, try and go out and taste the honey.